Yay! OK, so this is going to be live and real. Nothing, no, nothing planned or fake. And I'll try to cover my main idea in about 15 minutes so we can have lots of time to ask questions and interact. Because AI and AR is the magic bullet, right? I actually think it kind of is. <laughs> We're not supposed to like shiny pennies. We're not supposed to go for the magic bullet. But the combination of the two is really interesting. And so that is what I would like to talk about. In order to give you a sense of what, what domain we're talking about, I am going to just show this little video and talk to it instead of just give you some bullet points. So what is augmented reality data viz look like? It looks like Iron Man. It looks like you floating your data and your content over the conference room table in front of you, being able to interact with it with your avatar, and in a multi-user co-located co environment where everyone can see the data, see it on the table in the right place, just like the movies, <laughs> and be able to interact with it. And I mean interact. Everyone should be able to have full mastery and control over the data, not just the presenter. This feels like a very different experience than looking at a PowerPoint deck, for example. So why is AR particularly valuable for data viz? Just a couple of points on that before we bring the AI piece into it. So being able to see a lot of detail in front of you gives you a sense of credibility and the, especially if it's interactive, you can drill down so that instead of building bar charts, more rectangles in space, instead a bar chart becomes a bunch of dots. And each dot is the thing itself. So we can say, oh, that's John Smith. He bought this thing. He purchased XYZ. And now you have a sense of credibility in the data. And you can see so much more data at once that you can overcome some of the visual crowding that you get on 2D screens. Your stereo view is very important here to give you that good sense of depth. And the combination of the two, greater credibility, greater interacti interactivity, fewer individual slides. For this example here, this is a, a um, financial services use case where you can create basically a single visual which represents someone's portfolio. Everyone can interact with it. Everyone can filter it. Everyone can drill down so that you don't need to go through a slide deck of this stock, and then this stock, and then this stock. And let's face it, PowerPoint is a bore. But worse than that, it violates the way our brains work. OK, this is the spatial crowd, right? Spatial computing is really valuable because it activates our hippocampus and gives us a mental place to put the information. And that mental place sticks. You guys all probably have heard the whole hippocampus routine many a time now. But for the new folks, our hippocampus is a little part of our brain that gives us our spatial awareness. And it also sends information directly into our longer term memory. It's our mammalian brain that likes to remember where the food is, if you want to use the little, little uh, mouse example, right? So, Moving on, if that's what I mean by AR, how does AI come into this equation? Why is AI uniquely valuable to AR? Well, interfaces in an augmented reality space, we don't want to see buttons and menus floating around our room. It's just, it just doesn't feel right. It's too complex. It's just, and clutter is a really big problem with augmented reality. Right? You do not want to, um, you, you basically want to keep it as simple as possible. This isn't really the virtual space where you can, hey, you can put any menu you want over on the left hand side or in the other corner of the room or, or you know, just looking around. Instead, you really want to just direct the user's attention and have them be able to interact there. So AI is incredibly valuable to AR for solving the user e interface problems, solving typing problems, things like that. I think the other way around is even more interesting, because you probably haven't heard this part of it, which is AI is still giving us lots of words. 
yeah, it's generating images and it's generating avatars, but when it comes to symbolic information, it's more and more words. Our brains don't really hold on to words. Yes, we really loved stories. <clears throat> In our case, data stories. But those stories and all those words need to get hung off of the coat rack of our mind in order for us to remember them long term. So now the AI is generating stuff and adding to the visualization. Now you've given your brain a visual to hold on to. Particularly valuable is even if you're just doing it by yourself, oh, this is great, I built my mental model. And we do use our mental models are 3D. We forget that because we're so used to looking at books and flat things. But our mental models are actually 3D. But you don't know what your audience has in their mind. But if you can put it on the table in front of you, now both you and your audience has the same mental model. You're all feeling like you're making the best decisions you've ever made. So why talk about it if you can show it? So let's just do that. May the demo gods be with me. This is, um, I am showing it here on my computer just because streaming in a headset, forgive me, pretend that you're actually looking at in a headset in augmented reality. The, this user interface is, um, is that, right? It's, not, um, it's uh, not designed to be a flat screen. So let's just start to talk to this thing. First of all, we're looking at a life expectancy data set. Um, so some of the data goes back to the year 1500, most of it's more in the 1800s. You can see that the whole world's life expectancy has improved radically in the last 200 years. Filter to show me just the United Kingdom. It recognizes my voice, drops it in, maybe two seconds. Filter to show me European countries. Boom, come on. Ooh, the demo gods, there we go. Okay, so, so network delays. I'm actually running on my hotspot because I thought that was the, the best connection here. Filter to show me European countries. Oh, I'm sorry, it already did that. And you can see that going back to like the United Kingdom there. Filter to show me um, 1800s to present day. Now, you can manipulate a lot more than just um, filtering the, the content. Maybe we can add labels showing the country. In this case, this is a good example of the feedback loop. It's, you know, is that really what we wanted? There's an awful lot of labels, a um, little, little ugly there. Only show the label when the, uh, when the data is the maximum for life expectancy for that country. You can hesitate, you can, you know, kind of hem and haw when you talk to it, and that's a little bit more reasonable, right? Putting the labels just on the top there. Okay, so, so that's cool. I could change the colors. There's other things I could do, but uh, basically anything you can, uh, you know, visualize, uh, manipulate the visualization. But let's dig into something a little bit more exciting. This first time everybody's seen this, um, except for a few select customers. It's just been working for about two weeks. And I will mention that we do not consider this to be production code. We are looking for partners to help us finish this off and apply it in specific use cases. So here we go. Let's have the um, AI manipulate the underlying data set. Replace the life expectancy with um, a 10-year moving average of life expectancy per country. So pretty common kinds of things. You want to smooth out your curve, especially if you're looking at like stock data, et cetera. It writes the Python code. It gives us a little sample of the data and throwing it back into 3D space. Now you can see all the smooth curves as it did that moving average. Restore the original data set. The UI here is um, still a little bit prototypical. Um, we'll, uh, there's more, we're needing to do more clicks than you actually have to do, but it, um, this is a sophisticated crowd. You can appreciate that. It did something wrong, so let's try again. Return to the original data set. We'll talk about what success rate means in just a minute.
Oh, come on. Don't do this to me. Yes. So it's trying to, instead of using our default data set, it's trying to manipulate something else. Let's try one more time. See, no, please return to the original data set. Sometimes if you argue with it, it does better. Uh, it's, it, it thinks, for some reason, it thinks that Afghanistan is the original data. OK, live demos, here we go. We will get ourselves back to a good state. Oh, I've been doing demos all week. This is the first time it's done this particularly. And that's not even smart, right? Just get me back to original data. That's not even really AI. So, so uh, I'll take, a, take a, a pass there. So this is running in a web browser. Um, our system, uh, we think that using WebXR and a Unity app um, in order to have a maximum ability to share uh, content between everybody in that meeting is really, really vital. So one of the things that's interesting about this data is these big drops, right? In life expectancy, that's probably maybe some of humanity's greatest failures. So let's focus in on that. We'll go back to full screen. It's a little prettier. Filter to show me only when the life expectancy drops uh, by 30% within the country and show me 10 data points before and after. I could have described that in much more data science terms, but I'm trying to think of how end users, especially non-sophisticated users, might do this kind of a query. And look at that. It's, dropped. it's showing only those drops in time. And, but you might go, oh, so what happened in Cambodia on this particular year? What happened here? So it knows the context of what here means because of what I've selected, and it tells me what was going on with the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia in 1975. A number of different features here presented. But first, pretty cool, right? <laughs> Thank you. Pretty sweet. OK, so let's talk about a little bit more technically what's going on under the covers um, so that you can do it too. Um, and so first of all, we're using the Whisper API to recognize the voice. That's uh, OpenAI's um, voice, uh, voice to text. Right now, I think it's one of the best out there. And you can tell the responsiveness is really high, getting about two second responses between recognizing the voice um, writing the Python code and putting it back into the 3D space, I think it's pretty amazing. And that's part of the, the um, part of, uh, this is all, what you're seeing is an open AI uh, implementation with ChatGPT 4.0, by the way. So we start with the Whisper API. Now we have the text. We're going to figure out, there's actually a number of different things we need to figure out in order to proceed. So we um, make some decisions based on what we think the user intent is. We may go out to a vector database in order to do a rag. You've got to be able to upload your own PDF documents in order to query against those. What you saw when I asked it what happened here, that was actually querying against ChatGPT's corpus of knowledge. That's a valuable use case, but having your own um, PDF rags in an enterprise environment is actually truly vital. Then we send it off to Hugging Face on our server. So the fact that we are using ChatGPT 4.0 is not a dependency. Many models uh, you know, can serve that purpose. And our customers are building their own, like consultancy customers. So we um, expect that will be quite different. And I think there's a little bit of conversation about having on-device LLMs at this conference from Qualcomm and others, or, or most everyone. And so using a variety of smaller models between what's going on in the headset and what you need to send to the um, server will give you better latency and better privacy. So I think there's still going to be decisions. I think we're not going to be able to get everything onto our headsets. So we're still going to need some queries. We're going to need to go out to the server. But some of the really quick, smaller things on device will be really interesting. OK, so you get something from the LLM. Then we decide what to do with it. Are we going to return information to say, oh, the user wanted to manipulate the, the visualization. We get JSON back. We run our own code. 
is it text response? Um, should we just go ahead and show it in the window? Or did the, use, did the system write some Python? We have to execute that in the sandbox, create a new CSV, get it back up to the client, and put it in a 3D space. OK, basically what I just said. It's not a single prompting system. You got to figure out what to deal, how to deal with the data effectively. You can't just upload a big data set to an LLM. First of all, it's way too big. You're going to mess up your context. Second, it's not, not going to know what to do with it. So how this is doing it, you can even see it was grabbing the first 10, 10 rows, trying to characterize the data. There's a bunch of things you can do to characterize the data and then take that characterization and give it to the LLM so it has a sense of what we're talking about. Um, I already talked about on device. OK, so almost done with the slides, so get your questions ready. Um, user expectations. I used to work at Apple Computer. In 1991, we were working on speech recognition. And we would put users in front of it. It was a terrible system, right? The market didn't care. It, it failed. It only responded about 95% of the time correctly. Okay? Imagine if your mouse, one out of every 20 clicks, did absolutely the wrong thing. Right? Completely unusable. So one, one of my jokes was, Casper, begin brain surgery now. People would sit in front of this computer and ask it to do things that no computer had ever done. Right? So how do you set the user expectations, and what does task success mean? My definition, I'm sure that there's, there's scientists and researchers that have much better definitions, but my definition is it comes back and basically does what, it, what you told it to do. If you told it to do the wrong thing and it comes back and, and it did the wrong thing, it did what you asked but it wasn't your intention, well, that's still a little bit on you. <laughs> but if it's, um, yes, there's prompting, we can talk about that, but um, what does, if a system is 80% successful, will that be enough? No, no, it's gotta be above 95, probably more like 98%. And it's okay if the, if the AI comes back and says, I didn't understand you. That is still success, more, not total, but better than doing the wrong thing and now you're in a bad state. Like I was in a bad state, it wouldn't come back. It was, it was stuck on Afghanistan for some reason. Okay. Is this perfect? Is this the world that we all need to live in? Voice control is an imprecise mechanism to control a precise outcome. Maybe the whole system idea is flawed. I'll leave that to you to think about. And how do we deal with prompting? Prompting, how do you train people to do prompting? Okay, questions? We got seven minutes, please. Yeah, uh, my question is, uh, so like you have a lot of data, so do you fine tune those uh, chatbots with those data? Do you do any kind of fine tuning with that? No fine tuning, we're using out of the box LLMs with a rag to um, focus on specific text-based knowledge response, but no fine tuning. Next. Any ideas how would you would use this in your life, in your enterprise? Uh, Great presentation. Um, question is, have you thought about a combination of interaction modes? Because sitting there talking to it, waiting for it to respond, um, there's time that'll add up, right, as you're interacting with it. You know, have you thought about the interaction of having some buttons, what those types of buttons possibly would be, um, and having a combination of multimodal interaction? Sure. So something like this. Add a legend based on country. Now if I want to filter certain countries or highlight certain countries, I don't need to talk to it to do it, right? So you certainly, there's certainly a room for, um, for non-voice control. One of the things I think we do want to avoid is lots of buttons in the space. And in some ways, that's up to the author to make sure that they've got the right level of control for the user. Right. In, in this case, by default, it highlights, but you can also make it isolate um, and you know, filter out other things. Another question, please. Yes. Uh, my name is Navid. Uh, it's more of a curiosity question. How does one get started in 3D visualization? Because I'm a complete novice, but I'm really attracted by what I see, <laughs> and I'm just curious. 
<laughs> um, so this has been an eight-year journey for me <laughs> and with a company with 10 engineers. There's about 30 man years of code behind this, of effort in the code behind this. Um, a lot of that in the, you know, like the multi-user experience and, and all of that. So um, the place I would start, if you're kind of interested, is just start talking to ChatGPT. You know, you can upload data sets and start to play with that. Um, I did that with earlier versions a year ago. I remember the Saturday night, I was like, I wonder if it could, and that just sent us down this incredible path. Within, within an hour, I was seeing things that proved to me that this was going to be a viable, viable, viable option. Um, if you understand data viz, if you already have some data science, that's a big you know, piece of it. And when it comes to the 3D part, um, under the covers, this is written in 3JS. And then we you know, ported the JavaScript code to Unity C Sharp. So um, you can start to code it. But the other way to is just come to a.flow.gl or flowimmersive.com and we can, we can talk. <laughs> Come on, I got, I got another three, four minutes. Yes, sir. So what's a, um, a sweet spot for Flow Immersive? So I'm a, uh, I work in agriculture. Um, I've got agronomists who want to be able to explain to farmers about their data and we need to invest in this space. So I'm just curious how Flow could potentially assist my business to talk an agronomist to a farmer. Let's talk about your use case specifically, maybe after, but it, so let me generalize just a little bit. What kind of data is interesting to use in this kind of environment? So if there's a lot of it, um, if it's highly complex with lots of variables, so you've got a geographic component, you've got a time-based component, you've got multiple metric um, components, um, you've possibly got lots of situations where you need to interact with multiple data sets, like agronomists are going to want to understand the weather at a pretty fine-tuned level for this particular place, for this field, for this state, or whatever, you're, you're, or they're going to want to be able to swap in and out um, uh, you know, different kinds of crops or different, you know, a whole bunch of different variables, how much fertilizer you use, right? You've got so many variables, right? That's a good example for flow. If you just want to show another bar chart, go use PowerPoint and bore your audience. <laughs> but if you want to have that situation where you can really see all those variables quickly, and the other piece of it is to make sure that, well, for us, I think our value is in the communication piece of the pipeline, of the data pipeline. We're not going to help you gather the data. There's a whole bunch of cleaning. Well, AI is actually getting pretty helpful there. Very often, there's a lot of processing and as we bring more AI, we're helping with that. In the past, we have, we've just said, hey, can that to your you know, R scripters and your Python scripters and your Power BI folks? More and more AI is going to democratize that. But where we really play is how are you going to communicate that? How are you going to help policymakers make the right decisions? How are you going to help CEOs and your sales targets make the right decisions, and of course, it's to buy your product <laughs> or to use your, use your solution. But um, that communication bit around data is the new use case, right? It's what have we been doing, like I say, PowerPoint? Or we do it in Tableau, and then we copy and paste, we screenshot it and put it in PowerPoint. It's not a collaboration. It's not a conversation. That, that's, that's where we excel the most. AI is going to bring us a little bit more into the exploration phase. Um, and operationalize it. And so, yeah, I'd love to talk to you or anyone else about how this can help you make those better decisions. Yeah, yes, quick please. question. Uh, this is a programmer question. Uh, just curious about the implementation, uh, why you chose to go with, I think you said Unity. Uh, it seems like what I'm seeing here could be done in Babylon.js entirely, but maybe I'm misunderstanding something. <laughs> Actually, it can all be done. We started in 3JS because Babylon didn't exist when we started. <laughs> so we've been around a little while. I started coding about 10 years ago. Um, and I do think Babylon is pretty cool. Um, the WebXR version of this actually also works really beautifully. Unity has enabled the headset manufacturers to take us seriously. It also gives us another level of security. A lot of our like, financial companies don't want to use the word browser anywhere in any of their security reviews. And Unity you know, is much more locked down with a full compile. So there's good reasons, but in terms of actual user experience, 
little bit of performance improvement, but not radically. I'm out of time. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.